The Pentagon Papers Cases, Did the Courts Get It Right? A joint production of the Historical Society of the District of Columbia Circuit and the Federal Judicial Center with Anthony F. Essay, who represented the Washington Post in U.S. v. The Washington Post Company. William H. Jeffress, Jr., law clerk to the Honorable Gerhard Gazelle during U.S. v. The Washington Post Company. David Rudenstein, author, The Day the Presses Stopped, A History of the Pentagon Papers Case. Whitney North Seymour, Jr., who represented the United States in U.S. v. New York Times Company. Jeffrey R. Stone, author, Perilous Times, Free Speech in War Times, From the Sedition Act of 1798 to the War on Terrorism. And Carl Stern, the program moderator, who covered the Pentagon Papers case for NBC TV. 60 pounds. Uh, 47 volumes, 7,000 pages, two and a half million words, uh, the Pentagon Papers, uh, the Pentagon's secret study of U.S. involvement in Vietnam, 1945 through 1967-68. There were at least three versions, lots of working papers and drafts, 15 copies were made. To this day, they are still locked up. On June 13, 1971, four months after it was given a copy uh, by super hawk turned war critic Daniel Ellsberg, uh, who had worked on the report, uh, the New York Times published the first of what was intended to be a 10-part series based on the papers. Uh, Ellsberg held back only uh, about 800 pages uh, of sensitive diplomatic stuff, what is sometimes referred to as the diplomatic volumes. Uh, Four days later, when it looked uh, like uh, the Times uh, might uh, not be able to uh, continue its series, he gave another 4,000 pages plus uh, to the Washington Post. The Times, the New York Times published for three days. Uh, The Washington Post got to publish for two days uh, before the government obtained restraining orders. And the government's point man uh, in New York was the U.S. attorney, Whitney North Seymour. I have to start by by asking him, what did he think to himself uh, when Assistant Attorney General Robert Mardian called on the telephone uh, and said, uh, Mike, uh, go in the court and block the New York Times from continuing to publish the Pentagon Papers? Uh, Carl, I want a a precise uh, wording of what he said to me. You may remember that we were having uh, the annual United States Attorney's Conference here in Washington and I had driven down the night before with my wife and our two teenage children and were staying in a motel across the river, and the White House switchboard had been trying to reach me during the night, but they kept ringing my daughter's room, and so I never heard the phone, but they finally (laughs) rang mine at 6.30 or something like that in the morning, and I sleepily answered, and this voice, Martian's voice, said, Seymour, where the hell have you been? Uh, that was probably symptomatic of the way the whole, our whole relationship went from then on. So had you slept <laughs> through none of this would ever have happened, is that right? right. <laughs> and then he told me that, in fact, the, uh, he had given instructions to our chief, uh, my chief uh, assistant, uh, Silvio Malo, a, a career United States, assistant United States attorney in New York, and Sil had gotten a crew together and they'd gotten papers up to go in to, uh, uh, the district court and get the restraining order. Answer my question. What did you think? <laughs> I, I can't get out of my mind that that story attributed to Lincoln about the fellow who was ridden out of town on a rail after being tarred and feathered. And somebody said, well, how did you feel about it? And he said, well, on the whole, I think uh, if it weren't for the honor of the thing, I'd rather walk. <laughs> <laughs> Probably, you know, it's... Nobody rushes to embrace fighting with the New York Times, and certainly not in a public battle. Uh, just because it's, it's tough or you didn't like the idea to begin with? Well, I, I uh, spent three and a half years in the Citizens Army in World War II, and I remember the first thing our sergeant told us in basic training was, a soldier, there are no excuses. When you get an order, you carry it out. And there I was, and I had, didn't much have 
an alternative. Okay, I thought you were going to say loose lips sink ships. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Tony Essay, you and your colleagues at the firm are representing uh, the Washington Post, uh, the firm of uh, Royal Kogel and Kegel. Wells. Kegel and Kegel. Wells. Uh, that's the law firm of William P. Rogers, who was uh, President Nixon's uh, Secretary of State. Uh, you were immediately uh, called in when the Post uh, was confronted with this problem. And uh, as I understand it, you and your colleagues didn't think it was a great idea for the Post to continue uh, publishing uh, the Pentagon Papers. Uh, true? It's true, but I need to elaborate as to what occurred and uh, what then developed. Uh, I just need to set the scene. I mean, the Post had published, I mean, the Times had published three times and was enjoined. And uh, early the next morning, uh, or mid-morning, we got a call from Ben Bradley saying, could you get the hell over here to my house in Georgetown? <laughs> and uh, my partner, Roger Clark, went first, and I stayed because we had the gist of what Ben was up to <clears throat> and tried to organize some research, and then went over and got over there about midday. And here in Ben's living room were 4,500 pages of stuff and boxes and chaos and about eight reporters. And... Um, um, so we started in trying to get a grip on the whole thing and the limited research that we were able to do, and we had to do this in a matter of hours. The Times had been wrestling with these issues for three months before they went to publication. And we were concerned about the Espionage Act, and um, uh, it can be read a lot of different ways as to whether it applies, applied then and applies now to the press, but certainly there was a substantial concern that, that it could be applied. And you just have to read Judge Wizard White's decision in the ultimate Pentagon Papers case to see that concern was well justified. The other concern we had was that uh, Judge Gerfine's order in joining the Times was very broad and applied to anybody who might be working directly or indirectly with the Times. And we didn't know the Post source, but we were inclined to guess that it was the same as the Times source. And uh, we considered it quite conceivable that we could be in contempt of uh, Gerfine's order. Um, on the other hand, we were very impressed with the way, despite the chaos, the reporters were attempting to go about to review and research and organize what they were going to write. And I particularly spent quite a lot of time with them in that regard, while Roger Clark took the lead in trying to present our concerns. And um, we basically, our concerns were compounded, really, by the fact that the Post was very vulnerable in two ways. They had just gone through a public offering, literally closed two days before. And um, as David Rudenstein points out in his excellent book, uh, there were clauses in the, uh, in the public offering that allowed the um, offering to be undercut and um, uh, removed and, and the stock returned to the post in case of a catastrophe or other significant event. And even an indictment of the Post, we were concerned, might, might trigger those clauses. Plus, the Post had television stations, and uh, an angry government can do a lot uh, in that regard. Well, Professor Rudenstein, who we'll meet in a moment, in his very fine uh, book, I'll give you a plug. Uh, you. The Day the Press is Stopped uh, suggests that uh, you and your colleagues were an obstacle, uh, in, in a sense, without uh, violating attorney-client privilege. Did it tell the Post to print or not to print? We advised not to, to wait for Gerfine's decision. We just felt that the business concerns were extremely great. Catherine Graham personally made the decision. It was a very courageous decision. She had eight reporters there who were absolutely outraged with our position. And um, uh, Chalmers Roberts, who was just whose name some of you may remember, was really thought to be one of the most outstanding reporters at the Washington Post, said he would resign, and I'm sure he would have. Um, and we had confidence and growing confidence during the day that um, if the Post went ahead, they would not be endangering the national security. And that was something that we felt confident on the whole way. So once the decision was made, we were ready to litigate, and we did uh, take up the cudgels and litigated for the next two weeks. Dean Rudenstein, did the government blow it right from the start by taking this sort of absolutist position that simply because these documents were classified that that was it, that a prior restraint should obtain? Uh, yes. I think the government put itself in a terribly difficult position by trying to establish uh, a rule of law which would have been kind of uh, judge-made law equivalent to an official Secrets Act. If something is uh, stamped top secret, then uh, you can't print it. And by taking that position, they actually tied the hands of Mr. Seymour, uh, 
uh, the night before he had to put on witnesses before Mr. Uh, Judge Gerfine for a preliminary injunction. But, but you understand, it was virtually in, impossible for the government on short notice to be able to go through all those pages and identify specific items. Well, not, the whole government didn't have to do it. They only needed a few people, and they had them. Uh, they had they brought three witnesses to New York who were capable of testifying about uh, pages and uh, references to the 7,000 pages. Uh, and they eventually did open up and identify things, but only after Judge Gerfine denied the request for a preliminary injunction. When uh, Mr. Seymour, who could recount this a lot better than I could, but he told me about this when I interviewed him, uh, tried to get the witnesses to tell him what was actually so terrible that was in the Pentagon Papers. Uh, uh, Mr. Buzzard, I think it was him, who turned to Mr. Seymour and said, they can't tell you. And Mr. Seymour then said, why is that? And Mr. Buzzard said, because the information is classified. Now, how Mr. Seymour was going to defend the government's case uh, when he was being told that he can't be told well, I think only Mr. Seymour could tell us how he was going to defend the case because it put him in a terrible spot. And I think there was a big argument in the courthouse that people were not aware of the night before, and then we had the hearing the next day, and the government lost. But were you boxed in? Oh, yeah, without question. Uh, uh, Buzz Hart, uh, you just can't imagine what a, a, a comedy the whole thing was. Uh, here was Buzz Hart as a legal representative, I think, of the Secretary of Defense. Yes. And we were saying, look, we got to know what the facts are here. Where are the problems? And he said, I can't tell you. I can't tell you, and I'm not going to tell you. And uh, when we kept pressing him, why? He said, because it's classified, and you don't have security clearance enough to find out what they are. So we went in to, uh, before Judge Gerfine the next day in a huge packed courtroom where some of your colleagues uh, had the uh, elegance to hiss at the government lawyers as they came into the room. <laughs> uh, and uh, we had a, a, a little jousting before Judge Gerfine in the public arena, and then he took us into the roving room for in-camera hearing. And in there, Robert Mardian, uh, who had flown up that morning, uh, was standing beside me, and he kept hissing in my ear, they're classified, they're classified. That's all you need to know. And uh, when Gerfine said, uh, Mr. Seymour, can you tell us what's, uh, the, where the problems are? I said, no, Your Honor, I'm not permitted to. There was also a context to this thing that goes uh, beyond the kinds of problems you're suggesting. Uh, William Jeffress was the clerk to Judge Gazelle, and he has reminded me uh, that at the time that this came up, uh, not a month had passed since the May Day uh, demonstrations here in Washington in which 13,000 people uh, had, uh, protesting against the Vietnam War uh, had, had been arrested. Did, did that have any influence? I would have thought it would cut probably more in favor of the government. I don't think it cut in favor of the government, um, but you have to realize that, you know, as I look around the room, I guess more than half probably of the people in this room remember that time, but it was an enormously tense time. I remember on May Day, this was just six weeks before the Pentagon Papers case was filed, uh, riding my bicycle to the courthouse through wisps of tear gas in Georgetown and past uh, armored personnel carriers of the National Guard. Uh, that was the day that protesters threatened to shut down Washington. It was, you know, not long since the race riots uh, in most of our major cities. Uh, and it was a time that I don't think it's ever been repeated since, other than for a very short time around the uh, 2000 presidential election. Um, but it, it really was a time when the country was as divided as it's ever been. And it came up in a context where uh, the government and the press were very much at odds. Um, the press was seen as not just by the government, but by pro-war uh, advocates as undermining uh, the national effort in Vietnam. Um, so it was tense in an awful lot of respects, and this uh, case was filed right in the middle of that, and I think that did have an effect uh, on people's views of how this case ought to be decided. And just by uh, ginning up interest, or, be, or did it cut one way or the other in terms of how, the, how Judge Gazelle viewed the case? Well, I think Judge Gazelle, you know, it's little known, but Judge Gazelle was by no means an opponent of the Vietnam War. Um, 
and a matter of fact, had very little sympathy, as I recall, for the protesters. But if you were looking for a man who was going to accept the word of the government uh, without convincing evidence, you got the wrong judge. And that's why it was such a mistake for the government to come in and say, this is classified judge, and you don't need to know any more. Uh, you need to restrain the press from publishing. There seems to have been an inconsistency, though, in Gazelle's approach, but maybe there's not at all. And you can, you can uh, answer that uh, for me. The, the judge, uh, right at the outset, he asked uh, the Washington Post uh, lawyers to uh, voluntarily cease and desist publication, uh, and they, ref they refused. Uh, and then he said he saw no harm in a delay. Uh, after all, the Post itself had argued this was just history, so what's the hurry, right? And then he turns around and he refuses to impose a restraint. Well, I'll tell you, he was troubled at the time of the TRO. Remember, the government came in on a Friday afternoon at 5 o'clock. He had to rule on the TRO by, I think he ruled on it within a couple of hours uh, after the case was filed. And he was clearly troubled. He wanted the Post to uh, voluntarily refrain from publishing while he could sort out the facts. They refused. Uh, he was troubled by that. He speculated, basically threatened the Post, uh, it seemed to me, that, uh, look, there is a criminal statute here, uh, and the newspaper could be punished uh, for a criminal violation if you continue to publish. But ultimately, the Post said no, and he had to look at it as just a raw, I believe he used that word, raw, conflict between uh, a free press and the ability of the government to maintain its secrets. And on that balance, and it was not an easy decision for him, but on that balance, he said, uh, as a court, I cannot make the First Amendment yield. Now, I will tell you, at this time, he had heard no evidence, basically. Had heard argument, but no evidence. By the time he heard the evidence, three days later, he was much more confident <laughs> that he was doing the right thing, because the truth of the matter is the evidence wasn't there. Well, is, is that so? I've looked uh, through some of my notes and some of the material from uh, that time, and I uh, have to ask Professor Jeffrey Stone, whose marvelous book, Perilous Times, Free Speech uh, in Wartime. I found the, uh, the quote that impressed me the most was an affidavit from uh, William McComer, the Deputy uh, Undersecretary of State, uh, in which, uh, in one of the affidavits uh, uh, filed with the court, uh, he uh, wrote, uh, there are people in other governments who assisted the U.S., uh, who will be killed today if some of this information is released. Killed today, that's pretty strong, that's pretty strong stuff. You, you'd let that happen? Uh, yes. Uh, I, think, I think the way to understand it is it depends on how specific the uh, request for an injunction actually is. If you're trying to en enjoin a broad category of expression, the vast majority of which is useful to public debate and does not, in fact, pose that particular risk, uh, then you're really using a shotgun to deal with the problem that requires a laser. Now, if the government could identify a particular page that could be connected specifically with the certainty of the death of those individuals, it would then have a much more credible argument. So par part of the question about clear and present danger, when the court uses it, um, you know, it, you could say that any publication of any classified information could lead to the death of someone in another country, and therefore no classified information could be published. And the, the, the pr appropriate response to that is say, show me the particular that poses the problem, and then we'll talk about it. And because the government was unable to do that in the Pentagon Papers case with, with the degree of specificity, I don't think that the courts ever faced what would have been the really hard question. But there was really the sense of attempting to suppress a huge amount of material, much of which did not pose any danger, and which did clearly contribute usefully to public discourse. What would you have had to hear that would justify a prior restraint? Well, uh, I'll give you a, a, an example of what wouldn't, but which would, in most people's minds would, and I'll tell you why it wouldn't first. Um, suppose that they could identify that um, United States soldiers had secretly massacred 100 uh, Viet Cong prisoners of war. And this was not known to anybody, and it happened a couple of days before. And the New York Times learned this, and it was going to publish it, and the government went into court and said, if this is published, we can tell you to a moral certainty that 100 American POWs will be murdered immediately in retaliation. 
Now, that's a case where you have a clear and present danger. Nobody could dispute that there is a, a clear and present danger within the meaning of what the court was talking about in the Pentagon Papers case. Nonetheless, I would argue that it would be inappropriate to grant that injunction because the American public needs to know that their soldiers have slaughtered 100 POWs and need to be able to find the locus of accountability for that decision and to avoid it happening in the future. So one of the problems with the clear and present danger concept, which really goes back all the way to Oliver Wendell Holmes and his, his initial promulgation of it in, in the Shen case, um, is that Holmes used the example of a false cry of fire. And he said, well, a false cry of fire can be punished because it creates a clear and present danger. Everybody rushes to the exits and they're trampled. And what even he didn't appreciate is that it was the falsity of the cry that made the hypothetical powerful. If you have a true cry of fire, it no longer holds. And so I think even the example of 100 people dying doesn't prove that you should appropriately restrict the information. So if you ask me what would be an example, let's suppose that we learn, New York Times learned today that the, um, uh, that the administration had broken the Al-Qaeda code and has been using that information for the past five years to prevent terrorist attacks on the United States. And that information has been critical to our ability to prevent those attacks. And the New York Times has this information. The government goes into court and wants to uh, enjoin the publication of it. That, to me, would be a pretty compelling case, because it's not clear that public knowledge of that fact serves the kind of public function that the knowledge of the massacre, in my hypothetical, does. And that in that setting, I think it would, a court would be very hard-pressed not to grant the injunction. You're saying there's no offsetting benefit to the public. Correct. And in, in your book, you reject this idea of sort of relative harm analysis. But here you're giving us a, a sort of a near absolute, the troop ship sailing kind of thing. Right. right? This is like the troop, troop, the troop ship sailing at a moment when there's no opportunity for political debate about the question. All that's going to happen if the news gets published is that the ships will get sunk. Can I spend a minute just asking you, what the difference was between Judge Gerfine's approach in New York, okay, and Judge Gazelle's approach here. And I think there was, uh, I think there was a difference. I think Gazelle, and I should really guess, I guess all this to, to Bill, I, I, Gazelle gave greater weight to the lack of congressional authorization, right, uh, uh, for injunctive uh, relief uh, in this kind of case. He also uh, gave a great weight to the Supreme Court decision in Near. He was influenced by the fact that a lot of copies apparently were floating around. Uh, uh, Gerfine, uh, on the other hand, did not, right? Is that, is that the difference between Yeah, but them? by the time the case was filed before Judge Cassell, <clears throat> Judge Gerfine, of course, had, had uh, issued a temporary restraint order. So the Times was restrained at the time the, uh, at the, time the government filed the post case. And he knew that in denying the TRO, he was ruling contrary to what Judge Gerfine had ruled. Um, but, and, but you're right. He was certainly influenced by the fact that, look, do I really have the power, even if I had the legal right, uh, to prevent these papers from being published? He could see that the Times has it. The Times is enjoined. The Post has it. Who's going to have it next? Uh, does he, is, if he issues an injunction, is it going to be completely ineffective? Um, so the fact that it appeared that these papers were being disseminated widely certainly had an influence at the TRO stage. Now, as I say, when he got to the preliminary injunction stage, I think he felt like on the merits, these claims of injury uh, are not convincing. I may say in response to Professor Stone, if there had been evidence before Judge Cassell on the preliminary injunction that 100 people are going to die um, next week uh, if these papers are published, uh, that is the kind of reason for which he would have granted an injunction, and said so. But David Rudenstein has uh, quite a catalog in his book of uh, threats uh, of harm that he considers to be uh, to have been quite realistic, uh, not overblown, not exaggerated. Is that true? Well, it's partially true. But let me, before I actually turn to the question of harm, let me just say a word about Gazelle if, and uh, uh, Gerfine, if I might, because the emphasis on their differences. Uh, uh, hides really their similarities, uh, which I think are overpowering here. Uh, both judges asked the, the, the newspapers to voluntarily suspend publication uh, before they entered a TRO. Uh, both judges put the burden on the government to prove that a preliminary injunction was required. Uh, 
In other words, both judges rejected the president's claim that judges should defer because they are incompetent to assess national security evidence. Both judges then heard the evidence, and both judges then found the evidence inadequate and denied the preliminary injunction. So that, that's, I think, the overwhelming similarity, even though there are some more obvious differences between the two of them. One of the things that I do in my book is attack what I think is the popular opinion uh, or the most common opinion about the case, right, which is that this is all history, that the Nixon administration began the lawsuits as a vendetta against the liberal Eastern press that had been after him for years, and this was his chance to sock it to him and that he really uh, wasn't worried about national security, but he really wanted to teach the Times and then the Post and any other newspaper a big lesson. And what I try to do in my book is to be a little bit more careful than that, uh, I think, that broadside in trying to parse through what the claims were and what the evidence were. The claims were substantial. You know, the claims involved the interference with the peace negotiations, possible harm to the POWs, uh, prolongation of the war, uh, disruption of the withdrawing of American troops from South Vietnam, compromising intelligence operations, and perhaps undermining uh, war plans, which were admittedly uh, outdated, but since the area in question was so small, they would give a lot of insight into uh, possible thinking by American military leaders and so on and so forth. Of course. But I was going to then say, those were the allegations. And by the time the cases got to the circuit court, the allegations were backed up with citations to the 7,000 pages. The problem was that first off, the government never really presented evidentiary testimonial evidence which explained the citations in light of the allegations. And the citations themselves were not self-revealing as supportive of the allegations. So that when the judges looked at the evidence as referred to by the government lawyers, it just did not think it was uh, supportive of the claim. Okay, but the government was saying we have to know what the papers have to be able to, to answer that question. And there was a suspicion that, in fact, the government wanted to look at the papers that the Post and the Times had really just to identify who had leaked the papers, right? right. That's right. And wasn't that a possibility? That, that's right. And the New York Times took the position, we're not going to give you the papers, and Judge Gerfine did the right thing and said, I'm going to assume you have every page of it, including the negotiating volumes. So you don't have to present to me or the government the papers. I'm just going to assume that you have every page. Uh, yes, of uh, course. Uh, Judge Gerfine, uh, do understand that when he got the case, it was a case of first impression. Uh, he had... Uh, he had just become a judge. Uh, he had just become a judge. Uh, he had before him uh, senior staff in a, a responsible United States Attorney's Office that he had come to know from his colleagues, somebody you could put your trust in, uh, Silvio Malo. If he said something was, some, was X, it was X, and there was just no question about it. Malo was carrying out instructions he had gotten from Washington, and he trusted the source. The, prob the basic problem was that the Washington people had essentially no litigators among them. They were policy gurus. They were people who lived in this extraordinary stratosphere of um, voodooism, if you forgive the expression, <laughs> uh, about uh, security and top secret documents and so on with all the, these fellows who walk around with guns on their backs and or making sure you don't say anything that will leak. Uh, just an extraordinary, unreal world when you get, if you've been out before a trial, an experienced trial judge, you know darn well what he's going to ask you, which is show me the proof. Give me the facts. What's your first exhibit? And that was the difference between the fellows in Washington who were giving the instructions and the fellows on the line and Judge Gerfine, who had been a trial lawyer, so he knew very well what the right approach was. Gerfine had served in the United States Army. He was extremely trusting that the what the government had said, represented to him at the outset was going to be true. I was there during uh, conducting the hearings, 
And I can't tell you how uh, his face betrayed his uh, total disappointment at that in-camera hearing when McCumber got in there with all these generalities about all the terrible things that were going to happen, and Judge Gerfine said, show me, show me, show me one exhibit. Have you got one exhibit you can show me? And McCumber said, no, sir, I can't tell you that. And uh, that's when Gerfine realized that he'd been snookered. Uh, and we, all of us uh, out in the field had been snookered, and that this veil that the, you, because it's top secret, it is top secret, and you got a genuflect before it, uh, suddenly was uh, torn apart. Uh, there was one thing that he kept, uh, this, I don't think many people know this, and I'm not even sure you, you know it. Uh, there was one thing that really bothered him. Uh, he was concerned that there was some uh, code material in those papers, and he constantly asked about that of McCumber and uh, other witnesses in the in-camera hearing, and their answer was, I can't tell you. Well, it later turned out there were some things that could have uh, had some uh, damaging effect. I always suspected Ellsberg uh, kept it out of the packet that he sent down. They couldn't tell because they didn't know, or they no, Well, no, I, I think probably he, he knew enough not to give it to the Times. But in any case, among those experts who came up from Washington who occupied my office in the library and conference room, was a fellow who was a code expert. He had a bodyguard with him who was armed to the teeth and whose assignment was, if anybody tries to kidnap this man, shoot him. I remember telling that to a secretary I had once, and her comment was, it must have been hard for him to get life insurance. <laughs> <laughs> in any case, he never appeared in the courtroom, but uh, I had... Uh, one of the, our opposing counsel at Cale Gordon was a classmate of mine from Yale Law School, Bill Haggerty, and I made a deal with Bill that the code man would meet with Harding Bancroft, the secretary of the Times, with no lawyers present, nobody there, to brief him on what these documents were so that the Times would know to stay away from them. Okay. Uh, I had to promise I would never tell anybody about it, and I did not tell anybody for 25 years until Harrison Salisbury in his memoir about the Times uh, disclosed it. But that was one of the very positive results that came out of the litigation process, that the lawyers and the clients were beginning to get ex uh, educated as to where the real problems were and then could act in a responsible fashion. Well, one of the things that the government offered, uh, especially in the D.C. litigation, I don't recall whether it came up in New York, uh, uh, Tony, uh, the, the department offered you 45 days. They, they said if you would hold off publication for 45 days to give them an opportunity to thoroughly re review the materials to see to what extent it should be declassified, and Professor Rudenstein says all but about 350 pages could have been, the, the, vast majority of it, 95%. Why didn't he accept the 45-day offer? Well, we, we felt that was a clear non-starter. First of all, 45 days would have led to three months and so on and so forth. And it would be a way for the government to start censoring. I mean, they would say, all right, 90% of this is okay, but this is the 10% we're not going to let you uh, publish, and you're stuck with it. And, you know, going down that route for us was a non-starter. By that time, we'd already started to see some of the evidence in the in-camera hearings. I was not there. I was not, I didn't have a security clearance either that was given to me. My two partners were. And they were more and more convinced that there was nothing there and the 45 days would just, uh, we'd be back where we were uh, right then. So that was not a difficult well, decision. We can kick around this idea as to how much harm might in fact have resulted from the publication of the Pentagon Papers, but with the passage of time, uh, the evidence seems to be what? No harm. And in fact, I suppose the, the most definitive study that was done it was done by Professor Sims, John Carey Sims, who got his hands on uh, the 11 matters that were presented in a sort of a secret affidavit to the Supreme Court uh, in support of the government's case. He had uh, winnowed down an initial list of, I think, 41 down to the 11 instances, his best shot, right? Uh, and uh, according to Professor Sims, uh, at least as to 10 of the 11, the 11th he never quite got a hold of, uh, apparently there was nothing there that he thought uh, would have put the United States national security in jeopardy. It's, Professor Stone, am I right? Uh, you know more about that than I do, so. <laughs> well, the, the, uh, the 11 items were Irwin Griswold's secret brief to the U.S. Supreme Court. 
uh, and that brief has been partially declassified and is available. Um, the, uh, and he did limit the items that the government had previously identified to 11. Uh, and he made some references uh, in his brief to the Pentagon Papers, but in many cases he did not. So that he made claims that uh, disclosure might uh, identify covert CIA operations. It might compromise how the United States gained information. But as I understand the, the brief, and I've read it several times, there are no citations uh, in the brief to specific pages in the Pentagon paper study so that any judge could go back and check to see if the study actually contained this information. Now, Mr. Griswold didn't want to maintain, uh, didn't want to have citations because he didn't want to draw any more attention to this information, so he said. Uh, at the same time, it put the nine people on the U.S. Supreme Court at a terrible disadvantage when they only had a few days in which to try to figure out whether or not the allegations were supported by the documents. Uh, because they, in the end, thought that the government had the burden and Mr. Griswold didn't carry it forward, even in the appellate court, uh, they lost. Now, everybody, I think, agrees that with the subsequent publication by the Times and the Post, of the excerpts from the Pentagon Papers, no harm was done to national security. Well, well in fact, the, the Solicitor General, who argued the matter in front of the Supreme Court, was later to write, what was the date, uh, 1989, this op-ed piece in the Washington Post, in which he said, if I can quote, that he had never seen any trace of a threat to the national security from publishing uh, the Pentagon Papers. And he said, it quickly became apparent that the principal concern of the classifiers it was not with national security, but rather with governmental embarrassment of one sort or another. That may be excessive. I don't know how. I, I, I'm not sure he more. really did his homework when he wrote that piece. The, uh, what uh, Dean Rudenstein has done as a tremendous public servant is to get uh, access to the sealed documents that were filed with the Second Circuit, which came about only after uh, Judge Gerfine had uh, refused to uh, count out to the top secret classification. Then all of a sudden, the people who knew where the, the bodies were buried, so to speak, uh, said, all right, here are the documents. And in, uh, I think we had 48 hours, we were able to brief it, uh, put it in a sealed appendix, which we gave to the Second Circuit, and it was enough for the Second Circuit to send it back down and say, uh, <coughs> District Judge, you better take a close look at this. And to my knowledge, none of those uh, items were ever published by the New York Times, which is why I believe the adversary process is that the Fifth Amendment is almost more important than the First Amendment as far as this case is concerned because it educated the Times and their lawyers where what not to publish. Can I uh, follow up on that, Carl? Because I, I think um, Whitney has a point, but I'd like to make a couple of others. On the, with the Washington Post, however, uh, first of all, there were five publications, three by the New York Times and two by the Washington Post, before there was ever any litigation. So they were on their own on that without any advice from the litigation. And secondly, at our end, at least, those briefs and the specific allegations remained secret. We never received them other than the, my two partners, and he, they were not allowed to pass that on to the client. What that does raise, though, I think, is an interesting issue, and I've not discussed it with any others on the panel, but there's a difference between what the press receives and what it publishes. And there's a second line of defense for the public interest that the press may receive information that is adverse to national security, but does it publish it? And as I started to say earlier, we were very impressed with the thoughtfulness and care that the reporters and editors were taking at the Washington Post with respect to what they published. And, but yet it seemed odd to me at the time that, you know, how were we depending on the judgment of those reporters and myself to some extent, because I was assigned the job of reviewing everything that was going to be published. Um, and I want to quote something from Judge Skelly Wright. We have not talked about the role of this court yet, and I think we should. And I would like to start with Skelly Wright, a quote the first time. The case came to this court for three, three opinions, actually. And this is in the first opinion when Judge Skelly Wright was dissenting about the reversal and remanding to Judge Giselle. And he writes the following about this issue of 
the press rather than the government making these decisions. And he says, it is said that it is better to rely on the judgment of our government officials than upon the judgment of private citizens, such as the editors of the Washington Post. Again, that misses the point. The First Amendment is directed against one evil, suppression of the speech of private citizens by government officials. It embodies a healthy distrust of government censorship. More importantly, however, it embodies a fundamental trust of individual Americans. Any free system of government involves risks that we in the United States have chosen to rely in the end upon the judgment and true patriotism of all the people, not only of the officials. So we have this very extraordinary situation then and today, and we see it in what's being published yesterday in the New York Times, where we are looking to the press to be responsible. And I so think Tony, would that it. apply to bloggers today? Well, that's the danger. Yeah. And I think that's a very legitimate issue. And uh, I know you were going to pose a question maybe to well, I, uh, I was going to ask <laughs> Professor Stone, what, yeah. is this, bottom line, is this a, a historic case about press freedom and the First Amendment and so on? Or is this just a failed proof case? First, I want to say, in response to some of the points, it's a mistake to think about does the publication harm the national security? It's the wrong question. Lots of speech harms the national security. Um, if, if the New York Times publishes a review of how well uh, nuclear plants are protecting themselves against the potential sabotage, that could threaten the national security. But it also serves a very positive purpose. Lots of information that exists in the American public sphere can be thought to endanger the national security. But that's never been, at least not in the last 35, 40 years, regarded as the right inquiry. The question is whether it creates a clear and immediate danger. And none of the information at stake of the Pentagon Papers case posed an immediate danger to the national security in the way the court meant that phrase, which is why it said, why the majority said, it could not be enjoined. And the necessary, the reason for immediacy is it, it, it presents an artificial limitation on the ability of the government to suppress important information. Because much of the information that, that harms the national security is also valuable to the public. And if the only question is, does it harm the national security, that's the way what frames the inquiry, then you give the government the power to suppress all sorts of expression that we today would never think of suppressing. There was, there's more to the context. Uh, Bill and I spoke earlier about the May Day demonstrators and so on. But there was another context, the context of credibility gap. The fact that the government at that point, for whatever reasons, I don't want to get political here, it had not come to be trusted in the story it was telling the American public about U.S. involvement in Vietnam. Doesn't that uh, shift the equities uh, a little bit? Didn't the government in this instance have a sort of what we might call a, uh, uh, can we call it a First Amendment dirty hands doctrine? Well, I don't, I don't doubt that some of the judges at every level approached the case differently than they might have had the administration had a, a cleaner hands in their regard in terms of how they had handled various aspects of the Vietnam War. But to come back to your question, I think it's an extraordinarily important decision because if it had come out the other way, we would have had a very different experience with freedom of the press in this country over the past 40 years. And the fact that the court took the risk and it's the, it was really one of the few times in American history that the Supreme Court took a serious risk in wartime in the face of a claim of national security. And it was quite remarkable in some ways that the judges who did take the position they did in the case were willing to do so. Because it put a jeopardy not only to some extent national security, which I have no doubt it, it, some of the information could have endangered national security in some degree. It also put at risk the credibility of the judiciary. The Supreme Court came within one vote of putting the matter over to the fall, right? Right. What would have happened in the interim if they had done that? If well, only Potter Stewart's vote stopped that. Well, I think the more time that elapsed, the more that they would have um, become convinced, as the lower court judges had as well, that there just wasn't the evidence to su support the well, injunction. And, 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 and uh, it, it, all the papers would have been leaky. I mean, it came out from the Boston Globe, right. the Christian Science Monitor, the Chicago Tribune. You really think that this thing could have been held till the fall? But the, the key, the most important thing I think about the Pentagon Papers case is what it did for the Supreme Court. I mean, it, it really changed the way the court itself thought about itself and the way the American public, I think, 
thought about the, the court. It, it suddenly was able, in a situation of enormous conflict, to take a risk. It didn't do it in the Japanese internment cases. It didn't do it in World War I. Um, it was willing here to basically say, we're prepared to take the risk that this information will damage the national security and take, and take the responsibility for that decision if it turns out that bad things happen. Well, think about this. In fact, Dean Rudenstein raises this in his book. What if the uh, Pentagon Papers had first been published by the uh, Altoona Times rather than the New York Times? Uh, some paper with a little less clout, a little less influence. Would that, have had, would that have made a difference in the outcome? Well, Dean, I'll ask you since you would pose the question. Well, it might very well have because we're dealing here with several factors that come into play when a judge sits down to make decisions about credibility and risks and harms. Uh, but uh, I would go back to your comment before about the context, and there was a suggestion that the context gave the government dirty hands on a First Amendment claim. And I would suggest that although that seems right, uh, it didn't play out that way in fact. Uh, judge Gerfein uh, turned to the New York Times when the New York Times was brought into court by Mr. Seymour and uh, uh, and Judge Gerfein turned to the New York Times and said, you know, we're all patriots here. What are you doing publishing top secret information that the government says is threatening us? So here's a judge who in your context may have been uh, uh, suspicious of the government, not at all. He was a patriot and he expected the Times to be a patriot. And we heard from Mr. Jeffers that uh, when Judge Gazelle first heard the case, he, was, he asked the Washington Post to voluntarily suspend publication. Now, Judge Gazelle had a reputation of being the ultimate war horse against the government. And what's his first response? Hey, sit down across the table from us and please voluntarily agree not to publish this, right? So that I, I think that you know, the context is a factor, but we, we should not overlook the fact that these were judges who were ultimately very sympathetic to the government and were persuaded to do what they did only through a rather rapid education. <laughs> there were a number of her heroic figures in all of this, but I wonder if this case wasn't hopeless from the start. Uh, you may re uh, recall that in the argument here uh, in the Court of a Appeals, I think it was Judge Rahm? Yeah asked the Solicitor General uh, during the argument, aren't you asking us to ride herd on a swarm of buzzing bees? Uh, this, you can't put the toothpaste back in the tube, right? Isn't that what it boils down to? Well, look, look the law on fire restraint is if it's not going to be effective, you don't grant it, and Daniel Ellsberg had enough copies of this document spread out enough places in the country that one injunction was going to be followed by another week. So, uh, and that was the case. And several members of Congress yes. had copies that they were attempting to get distributed in one place or another. So was this hopeless from the outset? Really, Ellsberg's uh, remedy for uh, dealing with the temporary restraining order. He said, are you going to stop it there? Well, try to stop it here and here and here. And he started sprinkling copies everywhere. And putting your finger in the dust. Which was very effective. I must say, uh, all things considered, some, somebody ought to be looking back and say, you know, Ellsberg rendered a pretty good service. But Carl, we ought to go back to what Jeff Stone was saying, I think, though, that it's very fortunate in my mind that it did reach the court, Supreme Court on the merits, and we got a decision on it. If it had filtered away because of the republication by other newspapers, I agree with his point that we would have lost the opportunity to have well, this type of rule established. Let's think about that for a moment. Four, at least four of the justices, and I think you can argue more, took the position that this publication did violate a criminal statute, okay? The, es the Espionage Act, I think Judge Gazelle uh, raised that issue on more than one occasion with, with what I thought was sincerity. <laughs> uh, uh, let's face it, we're in an era right now where the uh, Attorney General is making some uh, assertions with respect to the ability to use the Espionage Act to punish uh, newspapers who publish certain information deemed harmful uh, to the national security. Uh, Professor Stone, you've written extensively about whether or not the Espionage uh, Act uh, could, could apply to such publications. Uh, really, does the uh, Pentagon Papers case give us such a great foundation to say, oh, the papers could never be prosecuted for printing this stuff? Well, because they weren't prosecuted. Um, well, Russell, which is revealing, but, 
But I mean the, the papers themselves. Well, you know what I'm saying? But I mean the, the, the papers were not prosecuted. That's, that's the point. And I think there's a lot in that. I think anybody could be prosecuted. Could they be convicted? No. Yeah. Um, no, I don't think they could have been convicted. I think that that was less clear then than it is today. I think that at the time that, that the various judges and justices pointed to the fact that there is the Espionage Act, that this could potentially be a criminal uh, prosecution, that was an honest, sincere assertion of, of a possibility. But I think on reflection, um, they would have recognized that the prior restraint aspect of the case was less important in terms of the substantive First Amendment law, when push comes to shove, in terms of the difference between a criminal prosecution and a prior restraint, that that prior restraint doctrine has its greatest bite in those areas of the First Amendment law where the government has great freedom to have criminal prosecutions, like obscenity law or libel law. But when you're talking about putting in jail the editor of the New York Times or the Washington Post for publishing the material in the Pentagon Papers, I think the court would be driven to very much the same standard it applied in the Pentagon Papers case. Well, does the Pentagon Papers case tell us anything responsive to the assertion of the current Attorney General, for example, that the New York Times could be criminally prosecuted for having printed about, uh, articles about the NSA eavesdropping? Yes and no. I mean, you can distinguish it on the ground that the court makes a lot of the fact that it's a prior restraint. And therefore, it could be distinguished from a criminal prosecution. What I'm saying is that, faced with that question, I think the court would actually, the court today, would actually wind up essentially applying the same standard it did in the Pentagon Papers case. And therefore, yes, it would wind up being a very important precedent. Right. And it would prevent the prosecution of the New York Times, or the conviction of the New York Times for publishing the NSA story, for example. I, Absolutely. I want, I want to hear what uh, <laughs> Mr. Seymour has to say. That the Deputy Attorney General of the United States came to New York after the Supreme Court's decision and instructed us to open a grand jury investigation of the New York Times. And this was back in the glory days when the Southern District had a fair amount of independence and we said, not here, you're gonna, not gonna do that. Look, the, uh, we threw him out after feeding him lunch. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Mr. Griswold said more than once that he didn't think that a criminal prosecution should responsibly be brought after the court, after the government lost the prior restraint case, but if the government had never brought the case, the civil the civil prior restraint case, and had only thought about bringing a criminal prosecution under the espionage laws, then I think all bets are off as to what would have happened. With regard to your question about the current administration's claim that yes, maybe the New York Times is criminally liable, look, there are many many people who've looked at these statutes very carefully and who concluded many times over that they were not drafted uh, with the intention of making publication by a newspaper a crime. Now, they may be wrong, but there are an awful lot of people who are responsible lawyers in the country who believe that's the case. The Attorney General's office may think differently, but we would then have a, 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 a real controversy about these statutes. And, and remember, that statute is not simply, does not simply criminalize the disclosure of classified information. It's with intent, essentially, to undermine the national security, mm -hmm. which would be a, which would have been impossible given the evidence, given the witnesses they called in the Pentagon Papers mm -hmm. case. It would have been impossible in that case, and I would think it would be very hard mm -hmm. in any of these cases we're discussing today. Did you want a last word on that, Professor Stone? I think that's exactly right. I mean, the statutes were really designed to be about espionage and only very, only in the extreme example about, about the, the New York Times. So I, the, the, the invocation of the espionage that statute for a case like the Pentagon Papers case, I think was a reach from the beginning. When the statute was first enacted in 1917, the Wilson administration advocated a provision that would have given the, the executive branch the power to punish the press for the publication of information that the president had identified as harmful to the national security. And uh, Congress rejected it and turned it down. So I, I think that using the Espionage Act statute, either the original act or the, or the amended one, um, for a case like this would have been a real stretch. And I think the judges who were pointing to the Espionage Act during the course of the Pentagon Papers case weren't really probably all that familiar with the history as they would have been if there really was a prosecution. I'm still not sure I got the answer to the question I asked a couple back, which is, does this Pentagon Papers case stand as this awesome uh, icon of, of the law with respect to the press and the First Amendment, or was it simply a failed proof case? Since I sort of got you to ask that question, I guess let me try to start <laughs> off by answering a little bit in my mind and, and revert to this court, because I would like to do that. If you read the 
Supreme Court opinion. There are nine different opinions by each justice. Um, when this court addressed the case on the merits, and it was the only appellate court to do so, it was a seven to two decision. The seven wrote a per curiam. It was very precise. And basically, it took the standard in near v. Minnesota, which I'll just take a minute to explain what that is, uh, was a decision written by Chief Justice Hughes. It was dictum because it was a First Amendment press case, but it did not involve national security. But he went on to suggest what instances national security might be uh, a trump the First Amendment. And they were very limited. He cast them in what I would call World War I terms in 1930. Basically, things like specific troop movements, sailing dates on transports, uh, immediate injury of that kind. And this court took that standard and said, that's the standard. It's not met here. We're going to uh, go with the First Amendment. And I think when you condense those nine or the, the six majority opinions, at least, um, that was what they could boil down to. And I, so I think this court played a real, uh, uh, a real important role. And I think you can draw that from the decision. And I, I think I'm agreeing with what others are saying. And I think that concept would apply both to a civil case, restraint case, and a criminal case. Well, the standard we draw is uh, the government would have to show direct, immediate, irreparable uh, harm to the security of the, of the United States. The question we posed at the outset was, did the court get it, did the courts, let's make that plural, uh, get it right, all right? Can I say unequivocally, it's the single most important First Amendment decision in the history of the United States. But you say it got it right. Yes. Uh, well, uh, uh, just a small footnote to the contrary, or at least a query. Uh, what has made this a great icon, landmark case is not the facts. It is that the uh, New York Times and all other media have said it was a great <laughs> landmark case. Uh, the fact is that if you look at all the content of all of those uh, Supreme Court decisions, and read some of the questions that the uh, Chief Justice Berger's question is, why couldn't they have taken a little, if they spent four months waiting to publish it, why couldn't they spend a little more time just making sure they were right? Uh, the Dean Rudenstein quite properly says that it was because of the Times and the Post that the courts really trusted them to do the right thing. But I think, I wonder today when people have seen the editorial uh, structure of the times stumble a couple of times and allow falsities to be published, uh, whether they would have that much confidence in it. The fact is that the judicial process worked, not necessarily in the opinions, although the spread of opinions really uh, cast the issue well, but it was also in the give and take in the judicial process and the educating of counsel uh, and the parties that I think really made it come out right for the country. Well, the result may have been right, but Dean Rudin signed. He said it was a failure of due process, in a sense, no? No, I didn't say that. that you mean, well, I, I don't think it was a failure of due process. I think, you know, Justice you Harlan. Know, you thought the government didn't get a fair shake, didn't get enough time to do its presentation? No, case? no, no, not at all. I think that the government took, didn't take full advantage of the opportunities that it had because of the strategy that. Mr. Marty adopted. But I would go back to your basic question, if I might. Certainly, I agree with Jeff Stone. This is the most important First Amendment case in the history of the country. But I think that the relevance of the Pentagon Papers case to today has less to do with the First Amendment than it does with the independence of the judi judiciary and the judiciary's willingness to accept the fact that it is competent to make judgments about national security. Uh, the Nixon administration said time and time again in the, in the course of the litigation, judges are not competent to make judgments about these matters. These are deal with intelligence, international relations, war plans, and it's a time of a hot war where we have over 100,000 soldiers in South Vietnam. Judges should back off and respect the executive branch. That sounds very similar to language that we hear time and time again. So if there's a lesson here, it is that judges should, in fact, trust their own competence and their own judgment in going forward in the face of these intimidating claims by the executive branch at a time of war. You believe that the Pentagon Papers case led directly to the impeachment of Richard Nixon? 
I didn't. I, <clears throat> I think there was a close connection. I don't think I ever put it quite that way. Well, it, what I did say was that the Nixon administration responded to the Pentagon Papers case by creating uh, the plumber's unit in the base of the White House. And then, as they would say, everything after that was history. I was right? say, they right. broke into Ellsberg's office. They broke into the Democratic uh, office of the Democratic office uh, in Washington and the Watergate. And so on and so forth. Couldn't get relief from the courts. They were going to do it themselves. Right. right. Now, if that means that I say it was a direct connection, all right, I accept that. But it's with a lot of uh, in-between events. Please. I really have some details. And, Bill, when you were talking about May of uh, 1971, it brought back a lot of memories to me. There were no guards before the May Day riots on government office buildings. And the Department of Justice, where I was working, was open. Anybody could walk in. And it was the May Day riots where guards were first stationed at the Department of Justice, never left. And the reason I was there, I was an assistant in the Solicitor General's office in, in the spring of uh, 1971. And as I recall, I haven't gone back and checked, but the Supreme Court granted certiorari on a Friday morning. Mm -hmm. And the, our brief was due Saturday <coughs> at 10 o'clock in the morning. And Irwin, there were only seven or eight of us in the Solicitor General's office at the time. And Danny Friedman, who was the deputy, came around and asked for volunteers to work on the case. And every one of us said the same thing. Well, how can we support this if we can't see the papers? And at that time, there were guards, not Department of Justice guards, military, all in the hallway of the fifth floor of the Department of Justice from the Attorney General's office on down, having weapons in front of them, and, and you could not get by them to go in to see the Solicitor General and talk about, should I work on this case? So everyone in the Solicitor General's office, and I don't know if this is known, refused to work on the case, every single one. And then Dan Friedman went around and, as Mr. Seymour said, issued an order. We all had to work on it. I got assigned to write, and this may uh, solve one of your puzzles, I got assigned to write the national security portion of the brief with Richard Stone, who is now a professor in no relation, uh, a professor at Columbia. Richard is an Orthodox Jew, and Richard told me, well, we'll work on it together, but I'm leaving before sundown. And I said, Richard, no, you're not. <laughs> We're going to work on it together, but we're going to finish it before Sunday, and we did. We wrote that section of the brief. We had no idea what the Pentagon Papers contained. We made it up out of whole cloth. I remember pulling books off the shelf, Richard typing, I'm dictating, and we got finished. It was probably about 5 o'clock, turned it into Danny Friedman, and uh, the Supreme Court, we were shocked to learn, took it seriously. Thank you very much, and thank you uh, for uh, joining us.